Hey, I'm Alicia Bake. I'm Jen Greenfield. And I'm Jen Tifoni. VO Booth Besties listen to the questions you have. We find pros in the know to help you learn. And connect with our amazing VO community. Welcome, Welcome to, to VO, VO Booth, Booth Besties. Besties. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our new clubhouse in the house. <laughs> we are VO Booth Besties. Like our intro said, we're here to help working voice actors get your most important questions answered by industry pros who know. Each week, we'll have a new topic and a guest speaker who's an expert on that topic. Speaking of which, we want to be sure you are all current on the awesome speakers we have coming up and other exciting opportunities, so we're creating an email distro list. If you want to get on, just head over to boothbesties.com and shoot us a message with your email. A quick bit of housekeeping. In order to stay on topic and get as many of your questions answered as we can, we're actually going to keep hand raising turned off. However, the chat will remain open, and this week, JT will be monitoring that. Now, without further ado, let's meet our guest. Over to you, JT. Thank you, NJ. This week, we are honored to interview George the Tech Widom. Good evening, sir. George hey. Widom. Hi. George Widom founded and grew VO Studio Tech, which Edge Studio acquired as the core of their enhanced technology department. In 2017, George left Edge Studio to launch his own service, georgethetech.com, which you are mostly all familiar with. George is a 1997 graduate of Virginia Tech with a bachelor's degree in music and audio technology and a minor in communications. George gained considerable expertise in music recording by working with various musicians and artists in the Philadelphia area. He also got broadcast engineering experience at a Philadelphia radio station as the remote engineer for the NFL Eagles radio network. George entered the world of voiceovers kind of accidentally almost. The station's engineer built a home studio for Howard Parker, at the time producer at the station, and George came along to assist. Parker's voiceover career grew and he started doing trailers, at which point George followed him to Los Angeles and enlarged his already diverse experience. In the span of just three years, George worked on more than 15 film projects as a sound mixer and boom operator. Meanwhile, he gained audio consulting clients focused solely on voiceover studios and related professionals. Now, more than a decade later, George's extensive knowledge of computers, software, equipment, and troubleshooting abilities makes him a sought-after expert and indispensable on-call technician. He's globally considered a top authority in voiceover recording technology, having invested thousands of hours researching studio design and recording equipment, creating training materials for voice actors, and innovating new techniques. Among the industry stars he had advised are the late Don LaFontaine, Bill Ratner, Joe Cipriano, and Scott Rummel. Over to you, A.B. All right. I, just, I thought for a second I wasn't muted. Um, all right, George, we are so excited to have you tonight. And we, um, we've been thinking about, like, where do we focus our efforts? But there is so much to cover that... Uh, Visiting your website today, I was reminded just how much there is to cover because you have all sorts of resources on your website, tons and tons of them, actually. Um, we are going to drop a link in the chat, and um, I'm hoping JT or NJ can do that. I'm used to using Club Deck where I can do it really easily and can't do it so easily on my phone. So, um, all right. So I think the easiest way to break this down is first talking about some basics from your perspective, but this Monday night room is typically more working pro focus. So we'll get down into the nitty gritty, but, um, yeah, just for a start, tell us, um, when somebody is just getting started, but we're assuming they've already taken the steps necessary to get training and practice the craft of voiceover, they're ready to start booking work because we always recommend they do all that other stuff first. But once mm -hmm. they've accomplished that goal and they want to establish a home studio, where do you recommend they begin? Assuming their price point is as low as possible. Sure. Yeah, You well, you just have to start, right? So, and starting on a budget is key and you should know what your budget is before you start. I mean, it's kind of like you're starting a business. It's not kind of like you are. So you should have a very good idea of what you intend to invest in this setup setup and everybody's at a different place so it doesn't mean you need to start cheap it means you need to start on your budget 
and you you can start um with usb mics there's one in particular that i've been recommending and i've actually used myself um that's a hundred bucks and it is remarkably good for many kinds of voiceover work and especially for traveling um and so you can start at that price point that that's the uh, rode video mic go two um and it's an amazingly effective little tiny lightweight portable shotgun type mic um and you use that mic correctly and you'd be amazed at how good of a recording you can get in a very minimal with a very minimal amount of effort uh, um involved in creating a recording space i mean you take that mic plug it into a laptop or a, an iphone and then go into a closet <laughs> or get into the back seat of your car and you can get some extremely good recordings with minimal effort i'm not saying that's what you want to do full time because when you really get this when you take this seriously you need a fixed consistent location in which you can record but when you're just getting started it is nowhere near as expensive as it used to be to get really good sounding audio so don't don't overspend yeah i remember when i first began um investigating voiceover so this was like 2009 ish you really had to go into a studio um because the to get all the equipment and stuff set up was so cost prohibitive um that the bar has dropped right so significantly the gatekeeping of money is not as much as it used to be right so where what are some places you recommend people set up a studio um mm -hmm. Um, yeah, if you're really talking about uh, a permanent place that you're going to say, this is my, going to be my booth, right? This is mm -hmm. where my mic's going to live. That's where it's going to be every day. It's going to be in the same I'm exact sure. spot. That's the key. And so you want to start with what might be logical, but not always. And that is the quietest place you can find in your home. Um, it may not be the obvious place. But start by finding the quietest space you can. Um, that's really important because quiet is the most expensive thing <laughs> to fix. Um, you know, it's very, very costly to soundproof. And to me, soundproofing is such a misnomer. It's such a myth that you can buy something that will soundproof any space. Um, there are things you can certainly buy that will make it quieter. But depending on the amount of noise and the kind of noise, you could spend thousands and thousands of dollars and never really achieve your goals. So I really want you to start by not focusing on soundproofing, but start on getting rid of reflections and echo. And so a lot of people find their closet to be an obvious choice because it's already mostly dead in there because your clothes are in there. The clothing provides a huge amount of reverb reduction. It sucks up all the echo. So with a little bit of effort, those spaces work great. But if you don't have a closet that's big enough to accommodate you standing comfortably without you bumping into the walls, knocking clothing off the hangers, you know, stuff's literally leaning against you or the mic, then you probably want to look into a, a bigger space. And that might be like the corner of an office or a bedroom. And um, you want to basically create a room in a room where you just basically enclose a portion of that room and turn that into a booth so that acoustically you have a smaller space around you that will absorb all that reflection that the room uh, the room creates so those are the things you're going to look at first when you just want to find a, a place to record yeah those are those are really great tips and you're right about the sound reduction i'm i have a neighbor who mows his lawn three days a week i mean three days a week he's running some sort of lawn equipment and i built a fancy studio and bought a studio bricks booth and put inside of it. And I was so disappointed to find that some of those low frequencies still come through. And I called the right. company and they're like, did you really think you were going to get, I mean, they were really nice. They're actually really nice about it, but they're like, those high, those yeah. frequencies are going to come through. But my neighbor was yeah. running a jackhammer across the street and I was able to record. So it gets the bulk of the stuff out. So let's yeah, talk it's amazing. About... Sometimes it's shocking what it does remove. It's, it's yeah. as much shocking sometimes what it does remove as what it doesn't remove. But yeah, it's true. I've heard of those stories. And uh, I just, I want to talk to people before they spend more than a few hundred dollars on, a, on anything because I can, 
I can make sure you don't overspend dramatically on the wrong stuff. Yeah. So that's a great, uh, a great point is that if you're, if you talk to an engineer about um, where you're recording currently, you may be able to solve some of your problems without investing a lot more money. Right. Right. That's the goal. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about that. One of the biggest misconceptions that I hear and see is um, the difference between sound reduction, like you're talking about, and sound treatment, um, like how you said the boxiness and the, the you know the echo and the reverb. Um, can you talk a little bit more about um, what those differences are and what really, other than clothes, I literally went to Walmart when I was first getting started and thought I could buy an egg crate mattress pad, you know, that like, cause I see people with like what looked like egg crate on their walls. So I went to go buy egg crate foam mattress and tape it to my walls, but that wouldn't have done anything, would it? Well, it would have sucked up some of the echo for sure. Mm -hmm. So like the more stuff that's in a room, soft things mainly, um, the more soft objects in your room, the less the sound's going to want to reflect and bounce around. So I, 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 I love to say this, and some people really love when I say this, which is clutter is your friend. <laughs> so the more cluttered the space actually is, the better it is for sound because all the clutter, bookshelves and furniture and tchotchkes and objects of different shapes and sizes and all that stuff, the sound is diffused. It's scattered. And the more the sound is scattered, the less it's able to bounce around and, and, and resonate and create these nasty sounding resonant frequencies. So that's what we're trying to do. And you can start with a bed. You can start with an old mattress topper. You can start with a foam mattress pad. Um, those things do work. But nowadays, sound blankets or making like a little tent or a, like a, a camping tent type thing or a lean-to or, um, you know, a, a frame out of even PVC pipe with, with moving blankets draped over it is an amazingly effective tool at getting rid of a lot of reverb. So that can be done for a couple hundred bucks, and uh, that's going to go a long way. So, yeah, the foam, I, the foam mattress pad, it's not a bad idea. Um, it can work, but um, there's so many other tools that work so well nowadays that I tend to focus on better products but that's acoustic treatment right that's getting rid of the reflections and echo that stuff cannot stop noise coming through walls and windows and doors and the whole frame of your house those kinds of sounds um, especially the lower frequency sounds like your neighbor's harley davidson the traffic down the street a helicopter flying past all those lower high energy sounds pass through everything they pass through the walls. They pass through the floor of your house, the floor joists, the roof. They basically turn your entire home into a gigantic instrument. And it just resonates with that, that sound. And it gets sent into your booth. So as you found, even a pretty expensive ISO booth, if the sound is too loud or too intense, it will still creep in. So soundproofing is what, is the, is what it contributes to what I like to call quiet on demand. And when you need quiet on demand, that means the jobs you're doing pay well enough to justify the cost to help achieve or try to achieve that goal, which is I need quiet at 3 p.m. on Friday, right when the kids get home from school, right when the trash truck happens to be outside, but that's when the session is and I'm being recorded on Source Connect. That's quiet on demand, and that's where you really have to spend some money. Or yeah, move. that's... Yeah, or move, <laughs> or move, right? Yeah, that's when I that's when I made the decision. You know, and one of my one of my questions for you is, you know, how do you know when it's time to upgrade, right? When it's time to um, switch over your studio, or you know, and some people may never find that they need to do that. But for me, it was when I was started doing Source Connect sessions, and was I had to reschedule a session that had eight people in it and was worth multiple thousands of dollars. <laughs> and I was so mortified and embarrassed that I planned to building my studio the next day. So mm -hmm. um, are there other times that you know that people might think, okay, now it's time to upgrade, like not just moving up into Source Connect sessions, but what else might trigger that for someone? 
Well, that, that is a biggie. Um, when you're doing live sessions with other people, add the number of people to your session and the stakes are going up, right? It's like each time you add another person to the session, another director, a client, or another talent, the price per hour to produce has gone up dramatically. So if you're the one that can't show up that day, that's going to really hurt your ability to keep booking those jobs. You're going to not be known as someone who's really ready, quote unquote, for prime time because you you have to deal with noise issues so often. Um, so that is the key. That is really the key point and where, where people do make a big step up from um, a makeshift closet or a corner of an office or a blanket booth or one of those other more portable temporary solutions and go to something more heavy duty gear wise the only reason to upgrade gear i think is because maybe you're maybe you're still using your first microphone and maybe it's a usb mic and now you want to go to something more considered studio grade or professional that would be a good reason to upgrade going from your usb mic and going up to going up to something that has a separate audio interface um, if you've already got an audio interface, getting one that's more flexible and more capable um, can be a really good idea. That one that allows things like loopback or playback. So if you record a take and the, the director or the client more than likely on the other end says, can you play that back? Because they were, uh, <laughs> they were, they were distracted because they were listening on a phone and they weren't actually paying attention to the first time you read the take. Um, they say play it back. Well, an interface that allows you to do that super easily is going to be extremely useful. Um, and so sometimes those basic interfaces like the Scarlett 2i2, which are super popular, don't allow for those things to happen. And you have to re resort to much more complex software tools and workarounds to make that work. And it doesn't just work with the press of a button. So those are reasons to make an upgrade or step up in terms of what you're using. Um, and it, as timing should just have it, <laughs> myself and three other colleagues, actually, we're, we've been working on and finally are releasing at least a pre-sale of our own idea of what we think is the ultimate audio interface for a voice actor. And it's over at Centrance. You know the guys that make the MicPort Pro and all those portable interfaces? Yeah. Well, we, we got them to design one for us for voiceover, and it's called the Passport VO. P A S with one S, Port VO. Um, and uh, it's on their website. It literally went live today. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a huge deal for me personally because I've always wanted to have an audio interface designed for the specific needs of voice actors. And when you look at this thing and you understand what it does and what problems it's solving, you start to understand why it exists. And you start realizing, I can't do that. Oh, geez, I can't do that. Oh, it'd be nice if I could do that. Oh, that sounds really helpful. You know, that's the kind of thing that you look for when you're upgrading gear. Upgrading gear to improve sound quality, not really that big of a thing. Even really inexpensive mics and interfaces can can capture really good sound quality nowadays. You're just upgrading to improve usability, features, maybe reliability, and on some degree, I would say maybe maybe branding. You know, now you want to have a Neumann mic because it feels like you want to be playing in that club and have a Neumann mic. Then maybe that's a reason to buy a Norman mic. It's not because it's going to be the best sounding mic ever made for voiceover. Yeah, that's, and that is, uh, I definitely have had a lot of people ask me what kind of mic I have. And it does say something when you can say you have an industry quality mic, but in that vein of thinking, I, I don't know if you've noticed the same thing, but I see this kind of class system almost between microphones online where it's like, oh, you have a USB mic. Oh, I have a 416. And that annoys me. So tell us truly like what you're saying. Is it really, are you really somehow more serious about your career or better if you have a XLR mic versus a USB mic? Is there a big difference in the, um, for example, in a USB mic, the interface is teeny, 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 tiny, right? Versus right. like an SSL2 or something. So 
Right. Is the technology really better? Is it is it worth investing early in your career? Or like we've been talking about, is it one of those points where you wait until it's a branding thing? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, that story is getting more difficult now because Rode, which is one of these amazing companies that just seems to really nail it when it comes to affordable products that actually work and sound really good. They came out with this new version of their venerable NT1. So many people have a Rode NT1. It is a great sounding mic. It's under $300. Yes, it is often associated with a sort of an entry point mic, but it's absolutely capable of recording at the level of any Neumann mic. But it, at the end of the day, that is sort of a brand thing. Like, unfortunately, even if the mic is every bit as good sounding, when the badge on the mic is a Rode versus a Neumann, there's a branding issue. There's literally something that when you're working with clients that actually bother to ask you what equipment you're using, or if that actually seems to be something that is of importance, that might be an area where you decide, okay, I've been making money now for two to five years with my Rode NT1. Now maybe it's time to treat myself and my studio, up my branding image and buy that Neumann or buy that AKG or Sennheiser. Um, but I'm telling you, the, the new Rode NT1, it's called the Gen 5 or 5th Gen, is mind-blowing because it, not only is it a pro studio mic with XLR, it's also a USB mic. So it can do both. And you can, so you can have the same mic and grab it and throw it in your bag when you travel, and it will plug into your computer without the interface. So now you don't have to carry as much gear. And then there's another trick it has up its sleeve, which is a whole topic of its own discussion we don't need to get into right now, but it has this thing called 32-bit float recording, mm -hmm. which in a nutshell allows you to record without, setting, without having to be concerned about setting the gain which is bizarre, but you don't have to actually set gain. The microphone captures the entire dynamic range of the human voice. You wow. never have to worry about setting the gain. It's a, weird, it's a weird new technology. It took me a while to be convinced, but now that I've seen it in person, I saw it and tried, tried it out at VO Atlanta, and I got to see it in the real world and said, yeah, verify that what they say it does, it actually does. Um, it's kind of a paradigm shift. So you know, technology is changing all the time, but this is something that's new. And it, it's, it's something that unfortunately, as Terry pointed out, is currently only functioning on Mac systems, but I'm sure it will come to Windows eventually, this 32-bit float technology. Um, but um, it's, it's pretty remarkable. And I think it's going to be really useful for people doing a lot of uh, video game stuff. It's one of the number one things people are always asking me, what do I set the game to when I'm doing a game where my dynamic range is crazy? from barely talking to full-on battle chatter. What do we set the game to? You know, So techno like this makes that issue go away. You don't even have to set gain anymore. It's pretty, pretty wild. So let me ask you a question um, about that that maybe others are wondering too. I don't have a Rode NT1 fifth gen. I, I do have my original Rode NT1 because I can't bring myself to get rid of it because it's such a good mic. Yeah, but I'm using a Mac system, and I do have the option to do 32-bit float, but I've never used it. Is that something that works when you don't have a Rode NT1 fifth gen mic? The whole 32-bit float thing is quite confusing and actually pretty complicated. But the <laughs> things you do have to know are is that one, the audio interface itself has to support that technology, right? Mm -hmm. So most of them don't. Um, it's pretty new on the market. Um, and I think the Rode NT1 fifth gen is the only USB mic that has that technology built into the mic. So that makes it rather unique. The fact that it's $250 <laughs> is bizarre because it's even less expensive than the, the regular NT1. And it's the same mic. So they literally added more to it and lowered the price, which is bizarre. But um, yeah, that's it is something that's specific to the audio interface, and it has to be able to capture in this new technology and this new method. So even if your software defaults to 32-bit float, which bizarrely Audacity does and Adobe Audition does, you can be recording in this larger file with higher resolution, but it won't matter. It's totally a waste of space of hard drive space because the, the interface 
has to be able to capture in this in this um, this format. Okay, so what are good? Let's talk interfaces. You've you've got us a perfect segue here. We talked about the Scarlet. Um, we talked about the Passport. Um, I noticed you have the SSL two on your site. Um, that's actually the interface that I use. Uh, what are some other ones that you recommend, or is it better for somebody just to reach out to you and have you personally evaluate kind of what their situation is? Like, does it just depend on the person? Ah, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, some people end up going with the Universal Audio Apollo, and the Apollo is an incredibly high power, complex, and potentially very expensive piece of equipment. And I say potentially because it basically creates a gateway to a whole world of buying additional plugins mm -hmm. or virtual versions of pieces of equipment, right? And if you're you if you have gas, everybody know what gas is? Gear acquisition syndrome. <laughs> if you I might have, have that. gas, then once you get an Apollo, it's it's a real problem because it's very easy to end up buying plugins that you really probably don't need, but they're all so easy to buy. And they're also cool looking because they look just like this old classic equipment from like the 70s and 60s. And, that, and you end up buying things you don't need. So the Apollo not only has potentially a huge waste of money in terms of tech, it's also quite a very complex unit to get up and running to get it to do what we need it to do, right? Um, so I know many, many people have Apollo stuff. I have set up Apollos for almost 12 years it's been that long since they've come out and so i know them inside out backward and forward and even though i knew the thing could do all these things i still saw how much of a headache it was for so many actors to use and set up especially in windows environments where there were so many limitations and um you know i don't i'm not trying to turn this into an ad but that's literally why the passport vo came out it, it the passport is like the yin to the Apollo Yang, right? It's designed mm -hmm. to be absolutely simple to use at a glance. Hardly ever would need to crack a manual. Don't need to hire a George the Tech to make it work and still give you all the flexibility that you need to do, you know, pro level voice work. Um, so yeah, it's, there's a lot of interim, inter, there's a lot of steps from the Scarlet to the Apollo and there are steps beyond the Apollo, believe it or not. But really, if you don't need anything beyond a recording and a playback into your own headphones, a Scarlet will get you started. It's just, it's, it is unique to everybody. It is unique to, to people's needs. I think if you find yourself in a lot of Zooms, if you're doing a lot of live directed sessions where there's clients and others involved in session real time, those additional power features like the playback, like the ability to control your headphone mix correctly, so you can balance exactly between your own microphone and your headphone and the playback and what's coming from the talent or from the client and do all that really easily at a glance right on your, your device. That's where you're going to really appreciate things that were, were designed for what we do. Um, and there's just so precious little out there designed for what we do, you know, and we end up having to do all these crazy workarounds using software and using complex on-screen consoles that can really become confounding to use at times. Um, so that, that's what I'm always looking for when I'm talking about interfaces. Do they check all the boxes of painlessness, simple and simplicity, quality, and functions, you know? And, and so precious few actually really do. Yeah, so something like a Scarlet for somebody just starting out and then maybe like the SSL2 or like a audience somewhere in that range mid-range and then moving up to something yeah. like a passport yeah the audience is a, the audience id4 mark ii is a really good one um it's nice and simple enough that it won't get you into too much trouble it has enough functionality that it can actually do many of those things like loopback and other functions but um it uh where does it fall down not in too many ways. Like actually, actually, I think the Audient ID4 is a really is a great value proposition. I still like the SSL2 because it's a one knob per feature unit, meaning each physical knob 
that does a function is on the unit. There's no ever any software you have to look at. And I don't know about you, if you're a voice actor doing live sessions and you're, you know, you're in the frying pan, you don't want to have to scramble and look for software control panels on a computer to change things or fix things. Having a knob or a button right at your fingertips to make an adjustment, that to me feels more professional. In fact, if you know anything about video cameras or cameras used for shooting video, the, as you go up in price and complexity, it, it's not necessarily better quality video. It's actually more physical knobs and switches so that a professional can, at a glance, make an adjustment or a change without having to go into a bunch of menus and dig around in software. To me, pro gear should have a function for each switch or knob that you're not doing that. Everything is at your fingertips, right? So to me, those are the things that make tools work really, really well um, in, a, in a home studio when, you're, when you have to self-operate everything. Awesome. Thank you. That is, I've, I've never heard it put quite so succinctly. It's great. Um, NJ, can you take us to the half hour mark? Yep, real quick. It looks like we are at the half hour. We'll do a quick room reset. We have a great audience with us. If you've just joined us, we are VO Booth Besties. Our goal is to help working voice actors get their most important questions answered by industry pros who know. And tonight, we are joined by George the Tech Whittem, and we're discussing all things you need to know for your studio space and more. Thanks for joining us, and let's get back to the interview. Back to you, A.B. Awesome. Well, I want before we get into questions, because I know we have some questions in the chat, before we get to dive too deep there, I, I did want to ask one last question myself, and that is, can you tell us about the differences between a shotgun mic and a large condenser microphone and why someone might choose one over the other? We have a lot of audiobook narrators in our group, and I'm assuming we would not want them to go out and buy a 416. And can you explain why? You know, it's so funny. I, years ago, I went into a, a audiobook production studio here in the LA area. I went into the booth, and what do they have? Sennheiser 416. <laughs> I didn't really understand it. I didn't get it. But the owner of that place, Stefan Rudnicki, who's a total pro in the business, says this is the mics we use. It works as works for us. So all that is to say is that if the mic is used correctly and in the right context, and it's been produced by pros. You can use either mic for either kind of, you know, for audiobook narration or for gaming or for anything. But what a 416 or any kind of a shotgun mic design does, and they call it a shotgun because it's a long, thin tube. Um, what it does is it really kind of focuses in on the voice and creates a small sweet spot in front of the mic where it picks up the voice the most. And well, let's just put it this way. It creates a small sweet spot where the mic hears your voice. How you use that mic in terms of proximity to you or what angle you, you place the mic, whether it's straight into your mouth or on a steep angle, pointing down, is going to change the way the mic hears you. So that mic has quite a variety of ways that it will sound, depending on how the mic is angled and how far away it is, right? The difference, but when you go to like a, um, a large diaphragm studio condenser, cardioid mic how do you make that into one easy to say thing i don't think you can <laughs> but but when you go to like a, a standard studio condenser mic when we've been talking about the neumann we'll mention the tlm 103 that's sort of a, a venerable standard the road nt1 at the more affordable range these are what we call large diaphragm condenser mics and these almost always are going to be a cardioid pickup pattern now what that means is the mic can hear more of what's going on to the sides of the microphone. So it hears a wider area. Um, and another thing that these mics do because of the cardioid pickup pattern is they have a pretty pronounced um, proximity effect. So that means as you get closer, the mic hears more and more lower frequencies in your voice. So what happens is these two mics hear you differently and they respond to placement and proximity differently and if they're used in a similar way or placed in such a way that you'll get the most natural sound of your voice you'd be amazed how similar the kind of those two mics will actually sound um 
But it's when you start working the mic and start experimenting with placement and distance, that's where you really start to hear how the mics behave differently. And they really do. They, it's, it's interesting. And until you use them um, in your own studio and spend time with them, you won't really get what it is about one or the other that you really like or, or dislike. You have to really use them for a while. Um, so yeah, they can both sound great and one can sound better than another, depending on the size of your booth and the kind of acoustic treatment you have in it. Okay. Well, JT, what kind of questions have we got over in the chat? All right. Um, before I backtrack, um, Alexandra just asked, what's your opinion on the Zoom PodTrack P4 podcast recorder? I... Zoom still has to prove themselves as a pro device company to me. Um, I think they, I don't know that product well enough to, to comment on that specific piece of gear. Um, but I just found Zoom to be a little bit less on the quality side and a little bit more on the gadget side. So they give you incredible functionality and features for a really good price but I feel like they fall short on quality of the product, how well it's made. And sometimes the noisiness of their, of their preamps sometimes fall short. They tend to be a little bit noisier um, when you're comparing them right up against something else. So that's, that's where Zoom kind of misses the mark for me to be a, to be a no-brainer recommendation. But, um, you know, as Dan and Leonard and I always say on VOBS, if it sounds good, it is good. So if, if you're getting good sound out of it, Go for it. It's great. It, it's probably more c complex than needed too for voiceover, but um, you know, it's a pretty cool little gadget. And if you are podcasting, that's what it was designed for. And it's pretty pretty slick for doing multi mic uh, recordings. Okay, and then Brandon commented, <clears throat> Audio Technica AT twenty twenty. Right. That's sort of that's one of our longest running get your starter mic mic it, this was this has been about a 99 dollars condenser mic for a very long time it's not technically a large diaphragm what makes a large diaphragm condenser mic well generally a one that has a condenser capsule that's about an inch or larger this is really a smaller diaphragm condenser mic does it really matter not that much it it just means the microphone can't quite capture dynamic range from quiet to loud quite as well. Um, it's going to have a little bit more of a higher self noise. Um, so a little bit more hiss when you compare it to a, a, a larger, higher quality mic. Um, but yeah, a lot of people have used that mic to get started. And I guarantee in this room today, there's people using it to make a living. So it ain't bad. It's just, that's definitely what I would consider one of those starter mics someday graduate from mics. Okay, thank you. Um, Celestia said that she finds that she has a lot of clip when she's auditioning for a more hyper or energetic character. She wants to know if she buys a better interface like a passport. Um, she's currently using a Scarlet Solo. Will that help her with the clipping? Because she's a little tired of having to mess with the game. Yeah. Well, honestly, it's a lot simpler than you think. The, the key to, to dealing with clipping is to set the gain low enough so that when you're at the top of your vocal range, like you have to rehearse a little bit so you know how loud that you intend to get, but you set the gain so that you don't reach a clipping point. You know, you don't hit the red in your recording software. If you're in the yellow, let it mellow, right? Once you get the gain set that way, you're good. Now, what's going to throw you off is you're going to go, well, wait a minute, what about all that quiet stuff? It's really, really quiet. Well, if you're recording in 24-bit, now I know we were talking about 32-bit. Don't forget about that for now. If you're recording in 24-bit, which all the current audio interfaces do, this is what they're designed to do is capture 24-bit dynamic range. You don't need to worry about the low-level stuff being too low. You only have to be concerned with the high-level stuff being too high, right? So give yourself plenty, plenty of headroom don't worry about the quieter stuff being quiet. Why? Because this, the technology these days does not lose any quality. Um, basically, you have 144 dB of dynamic range to play with here. That is way beyond what any human voice can actually do. 
And so you're not going to have to worry about that. Your job as the actor is just capture the audio without distorting and clipping. The producer's job is to deal with the dynamic range. So if they want the quieter stuff louder, they'll bring it up. If they want the louder stuff quieter, they'll bring it down. Now, if you're doing an audition and they don't tell you we want raw audio only, then having some processing could be a good thing. That's one of the things that I do as a service. I create what are called processing presets, stacks, racks, uh, uh, macros. It depends on your software. That I, I create those to try to make the file you send out more listenable, right? So, so that the highest, the loudest points aren't so ear bendingly loud. The quietest stuff isn't so difficult to hear. And with the right processing, I, I can control that for you so that your auditions are just a little bit easier to listen to, right? Um, but yeah, don't worry about that. Just set the gain lower. Give yourself more headroom. You might have the gain on your interface at like 10 o'clock. It might even need to be that low. Um, but you're probably going to be fine as long as your microphone can handle that, um, that level of volume you're putting into it. And most, most modern condenser mics can handle very loud levels. All right. She said, thank you very much. Um, okay. Going back to the beginning of the conversation with sound treatment, um, David asked how you feel about rock wool insulation for a booth. Mm -hmm. um, well, rock wool is a type of insulation. It's, it's uh, what we call a mineral wool more generically. And it's this sort of gray material that looks a little bit like the pink or yellow insulation you're used to seeing, but it's just made out of spun molten mineral or rock instead of glass, like in fiberglass. And we like it because it just does a really good job of, of scattering and absorbing sound. So it's excellent in acoustical panels. In fact, most of those hard framed wooden with fabric wrapped panels that you see um, from like GIK Acoustics, ATS, and a bunch of others, uh, that's what they have on the inside. Now you can also use it inside the walls to improve the soundproofing of the walls. But it, it's nowhere near as a big a deal. It's nowhere near as like a big part of the the soundproofing properties of the wall, right? In the grand scheme of things, it it maybe contributes five ten percent to the overall performance of the wall. Um, so if you're looking to save money, that's probably a place to save it because you don't need to fill your entire wall with rock wool. But it is excellent for acoustic treatment. It does a great job sucking up echo and and reverb. Okay, so if he has um... If he has the ability to put that into his um, closet space where he's recording and just hang up a, a sheet or a blanket over it to absorb the yeah. sound in that space. Yeah, it works great. Definitely don't leave the, the, the face of that stuff open to the air because the particles in there, they actually can actually work themselves loose and get into the air and then get into your lungs. And that is not good. You do not want to get the particles for mineral wool or any of these products in, in your lungs. So make sure that if you hang it on the walls or, or glue it or spray it or nail it or whatever to your closet walls, make sure you do cover everything with, with a good tight um, fabric, like, like sheets, bed sheets, a jersey knit, um, or uh, cotton fabrics, or even like a burlap. You know, you just gotta make sure those fibers don't, don't get loose. But we want, sorry, I'm going to cut in for just a second, JT, because I do know David's situation. Um, and we're looking, we're not, we don't want to cover them with uh, something really dense, right? Because you do want that air to move through it to diffuse a little bit. So like a thin, like you're talking about thin fabrics, we wouldn't cover rock wool with a moving blanket, right? Well, you could, you could, it would actually be sort of a composite now. You're So you've got the properties of the moving blanket, which has fiber fill inside it, which, you know, is sort of like another insulation, but a thin, thin layer of it. And then you've got the mineral wool, which is going to be usually at least two inches thick behind it. So those two things working together will actually work relatively well. The fabric you wouldn't want to use would be something that doesn't allow air to pass through. So like a canvas type fabric. If you hold a piece of fabric up and you blow on your hand and you blow it, try to blow on your hand behind the fabric. If you don't feel the wind or the air coming through that fabric, 
it's going to be blocking some of the sound. So it will change the performance of the acoustical material, right? Yeah, so, I was guilty yeah. of that. I thought the fuzzier, the better. So when I had outfitted my space, I built out rectangle frames, put the rock wool in, did the whole thing. And in my mind, I was like, oh, I'll use like fleece. It's super fuzzy or, you know, these other fabric in it. Yeah, I realized after the fact that I was working against myself because it didn't allow the sound to move through. It was blocking the so point. So were you getting some reflection? Like, was it was it sounding a little bit reflective? Exactly. Is that what was happening? Exactly, because when you stretch, yeah. So it was just the 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 weave was too too tight. tight. Yep. Yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah. Yeah, the fabrics you'll see on most of those panels that are prefabricated, you can buy from like ATS. They generally use a very loose weave, burlap, you know, or jute. That's the most yep. commonly used fabric. And um, yeah, it allows the sound to pass through speaker cloth, really. Remember when speakers had speaker cloth <laughs> over them? The, the yep. black speaker grill material? That's designed to kind of look good, but also allow sound to pass through. That's really what we're, we're talking about here. Awesome. All right, keep going, JT. All right, um, new question from Michael regarding the 32-bit chain. His interface is part of his Behringer X32 compact mixer. The mixer shows 40-bit signal processing, but 24-bit conversion, and he doesn't know what that means for a 32-bit chain. Is he actually getting 32 to the USB interface? Uh, that's, a good, that's a very good tech question, and the answer, based on what you're telling me, because I have not read the manual, is no. Um, it's, it's confusing. The processing is working at one... <laughs> bit is what we call a word length, okay? Um, the processing inside is working at one word length. Um, the AD converter is working at another word length. That's 24 bit. Um, but there, there is no, in that device, based on those specs, a 32 bit. There is no 32 bit converter in the signal chain, right? So, no, that particular product does not technically capture 32 bit float. It's so rare that companies are just now coming out with gear that that has that technology in it. Um, so anything that was designed and manufactured more than maybe three to five years ago, it just isn't going to have it. It's that new. Um, and it's only been the last year or two where it's become affordable. Um, Zoom actually does make an audio interface that looks kind of like a Scarlet, you know, two microphone jacks on the front, a place for your headphones, a USB cable poking out the back. And they make one now that has the 32-bit float technology, right? So there's no actual gain knobs on the front. Um, I haven't used it. I won't recommend it until I've got a chance to use one. But yeah, not many things out there do capture audio in 32-bit float. That's a very specific technical spec. All right, and I've got a question of my own. Um, Great. I've been using Scarlet interfaces since my first studio in, in 2007. And the original 4i4 that I had was a workhorse and lasted probably a decade. And we replaced it with a 6i6. And getting Source Connect to work is a nightmare mm. because I've got to change all the things around because it's not that functional. And I cannot get my mic to work through any online interface. Um, oh, like things that work on Chrome? Yeah. Windows, IP right? DTL. I had a, a session with, um, with Lotus, and I ended up having to record and send them the file because I couldn't get my mic through the internet. So I assume that's a Scarlet issue. It could be. Which channel is the mic plugged into on the back? Channel one or channel two? Or uh, it might be it actually comes through my board. So it's a stereo into three and four. Yeah, that's the issue. You can't use three and four. Because most, most dumb software, not pro audio software, it's pro audio software, you can choose whatever channel you want. You know, you can use channel 17, whatever is available on your interface, no problem. But Zoom... Well, until recently, Zoom now actually does let you choose which channel you're using. Um, but um, things like Chrome, anything on Chrome, mm -hmm. will not hear anything on channels three, four, five, six, on and on and on and on and on. It okay. can only hear what's on one and two. 
So you have to repatch your equipment. So you're actually running your equipment through input one and two on your Scarlet if you want things to just work and not make you tear your hair out. <laughs> yeah, you really have to use input one and two. All right. So if I wanted to replace it with something that had loopback, what would you suggest? Um, well, honestly, you know, if you're not ready to wait for a pre-sale device that doesn't exist yet, um, then <laughs> honestly, what's on the market right now, the, the Yamaha AG03, they have a new version called the Mark II. It's pretty awesome. It's a pretty cool little piece of gear. It's under 200 bucks. Wow. It's got the loopback functionality, which you just literally flick a switch and turn it on and turn it off. Um, it, it sounds really good. It's got a cool design. I think I, I like the way it's designed because it looks like a tiny mixer. Um, it's got a microphone mute button, which is really unusual. So you can actually shut your mic off whenever you need to, which is great during wow. live sessions. Yeah. Um, and uh, and it's got some other bells and whistles under the hood. Like it has some basic DSP. You can set up a high pass filter and you can set it exactly the frequency you want. Um, wow. It's really got some clever functionality. So I'm yeah, going to need when, the name of that again. The It's the Yamaha AG03. And the newest one's called the Mark II. So that's, it's been out like 10 years. So we, they have a new version. Um, that one's really good. And that one checks almost every box that I would ever want. Um, the new one we're doing, the Passport VO, it it just feels a little bit more like a pro-level device for various reasons, maybe build quality and a, and a few other things. But um, the AG03 Mark II is pretty darn awesome for that price point. I think it's like 180 bucks, something like that. Wow. You know, so the ability to loop back very simply by just flicking a switch, um, you know, to be able to record with or without processing with the flick of a switch, to mute your mic with a push button, uh, things like this. Control your monitor mix really easily by turning another knob. It's really well thought out. It's a good little piece of gear. It sounds like it would be worth it just for the loop back functionality. I, I have loop back installed on my computer and I. <laughs> Still oh yeah, can. there's an application called Loopback, and yes. it's incredibly complicated. It's a pain. I even made a video yeah. teaching other people how to use it, and I still yeah. don't use it because it's such a pain to use. So mm -hmm. that's right. That's why I don't recommend it that often. You won't hear me talking about the software that's literally called Loopback because it's just another barrier of entry, barrier to entry between you and the product. It's another thing that gets in the way, another driver to load, another application to learn. And um, yeah, it's not for everybody. I, I don't like that extra level of complexity. Yeah, whatever makes my life simpler, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, Tara Lynn asked, what is the lifetime of an interface? How long can she expect it to last with daily use? Uh, that is something that nobody knows because it just depends on the piece of gear and the quality of the electricity in your home and how often it's turned on and off and so many things, but 10 years is not unheard of. Um, it, it tends to be that the higher end products last longer because they use mm -hmm. more expensive components. Um, so a general, a generality is that about 10 years for electronics is pretty common. Um, some stuff, some stuff you might get two to five years out of it. Some stuff you might get 10 to 15 years. The problem with digital audio gear or anything that plugs into a computer with USB is it will eventually become obsolete. There's a point where it just won't be supported anymore, unfortunately. So you, there's more often than not, you might have to upgrade. You might be forced to upgrade at some right. point because something isn't compatible anymore. Um, but yeah, 10 years. I mean, I've got some Apogee ones, those little black little cute little black interfaces with a silver knob on them. Uh -huh. um, I have a few of them in a box that have been given to me by various clients because they got frustrated with using them, but they still work. And they're, some of them are over 10 years old and they still sound amazing. So um, yeah, that's a great question. They can last quite a long time if they're taken care of. And since we, well, since you just mentioned the electricity in your home, do you recommend a power conditioner? Yeah, if if you're if if yeah, it's not a bad idea. The thing, problem with power conditioners is some of them do almost nothing. 
Some of them are really expensive and don't really do anything. Um, they're kind of nebulous, you know. Uh, sometimes they're sold by companies. They oversell them, saying that they'll do all these things that they can't do. So what's the what's the what do you buy? I tend to look stick with one of the brands that I stick with when I'm looking for these is called Furman. Yeah, that's what I mean. Their stuff is pro quality. It's pro, pro musician grade quality stuff, and um, as long as it has what they call power filtration, um, it's probably going to have some degree of of protection. You might also look for something a, a acronym, acronym AVR, which means automatic voltage regulating. Mm-hmm. And that means if you get a lot of brownouts or power surges in your area, it will keep the power from dropping out on your studio equipment. Um, some people do use a UPS or a, a universal, what do they call it? A UPS, universal power backup. No, that's not even the right words. <laughs> UPS, USP, UPS. Uni- universal oh surge my. protector. Yeah, USP. or power, power backup, backup power. Wait a minute, <laughs> my brain is farting. I can't remember what the acronym stands for. Anyway, yeah, it's one of those things that you plug your computer in, it sits on the floor, and it usually collects dust. Right. Um, it has a battery in it. Power supply, thank you. Universal uh, Backup power supply. You want to have one of those if you live in an area where your power surges or drops out on you more than once a month, or more even more than once a year, really. It happens enough in my neighborhood in Venice, California, where I... I'm glad I have it. Um, the monitors might flicker or something else might die, but the computer keeps running. Um, so it's nice to have something like that to provide an additional level of protection. Um, so yeah, it's generally not a bad idea. Not everybody needs one. I mean, if you're on a MacBook or a battery powered computer, your gear is generally being powered by the computer itself. So it doesn't really matter that much. You know, if you, all you have is a Scarlet plugged into a MacBook, it's not really going to make any difference whether you have a power conditioner or not, I don't think. Um, it's really when you have a lot more analog gear and a more complex setup. Studio monitor speakers, those mm-hmm. are notorious for getting noisy with bad power. So that's where you might want to invest in the power conditioner. Yeah, that actually is why I bought mine. Because mm-hmm. the monitors were giving me some hum and yeah, it was an issue. Um, we have one more question, uh, from Chris Lean. She's been told the Shure SM7B is a podcast mic. Do you recommend it for voiceover? No, because it's an, it's aesthetically the wrong mic. I always use like, I always try to use visual analogies. And so my analogy for this is it's like trying to do a portrait of somebody with a wide angle lens. You know what it looks like when you do a selfie or a wide angle lens, someone's at towards the edge of the frame and it stretches them out and makes them look all weird. Um, someone's always the victim of the selfie, the groupie, the grelfie. <laughs> when you're trying to get five people in one <laughs> shot, the people on the edges are all stretched out and weird looking, right? Right. Um, well, that's kind of like that for microphones. It's a weird analogy, but really what I'm getting at is the SM7B is for a certain kind of use case and a certain aesthetic. You want to sound like an authority. You want to sound like a broadcaster. You're trying to get the attention of the listener. That's what that mic was designed for. It's designed for really a high energy output, like um, singing or yelling or shouting or broadcasting or hosting. Um, and so when you're trying to capture the subtlety of a voice uh, for, a, for, for a performance, um, it struggles at capturing the quieter stuff. It needs a huge amount of gain to get a good recording level, first of all. And then it just doesn't have that pleasing natural sound. You just sound too broadcast. And if you sound too broadcast, you will not book that commercial. <laughs> you it is the kiss of death when you're trying to win commercial gigs that if you sound like you're a radio announcer, you know, um, unless that's the role of that role, literally the role is to play an announcer, you are not going to win using an SM7B. It's going to it's going to be a struggle. So at $400 mic, there are so many better mics less than $400. I would never start with an SM7B for a voiceover. 
All right. And oh my goodness, it is almost the top of the hour. Oh, and Casey, Casey oh. spelled it out. UPS battery backup, which stands for an uninterruptible power supply. Thank you. Yay, Casey. Casey. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it stands for. <laughs> That's why we have pros on the stage and pros in the chat to help us no to doubt, answer no all these questions. Yeah. Well, guys, we, holy moly, we made it to an hour, which is awesome. Um, thank you, George, again for joining us. Sure um, thing. But before we, you go, we like to ask our guests three for fun questions, kind of James Lipton style. <laughs> and the first, nothing too, yeah, nothing too bad. Uh, the first is, what singer, band, or composer are you enjoying right now? Oh, I, I'm still pretty obsessed with uh, Jacob Collier. Does anybody okay. know who that guy is? I don't know Jacob, or maybe I do and I don't know his name. Is he a well, singer? He's, he's a singer and multi-instrumentalist. Okay. He's one of those people that if you play an instrument, you'll watch him and go, oh man, give me a break. How can this yeah. guy play all those things and do it so well? Yeah. He's one of those guys. He's like a modern day Stevie Wonder, you know, in That's terms awesome. of skill and technology okay. and technique. And he's incredible. I love Jacob. Loves me some Jacob Collier. I've seen him. All twice. right. Excellent. Um, are you a podcaster? We find that our interviewees don't seem to actually listen to podcasts. I'm a podcaster and a podcast listener. So, so who, who, what, what are you list? What have you been listening to lately? We all like to learn. Um, well, I, I geek, I do listen to a, quite a few geek podcasts, so I do listen to tech podcasts. There's a, there's a, um, a podcasting network called twit, which stands for this week in tech. Um, I listen to those shows a lot. I listen to NPR on podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I listen to TV shows on podcast. I listen to the daily show on podcast, what they call the ears edition. Because there's some things I just don't want to sit and watch TV and I want to multitask. So yep. I will consume video shows in podcast form. Um, those are some those are the ones that I'm listening to probably on the most on the heavy rotation. Um, a lot of a lot of the you know current events podcasts, not really the fictional podcasts. I haven't gotten into audio drama, but you know. I'm still I'm still a magazine and periodicals guy. Yeah. <laughs> I don't Short sit down tweet. with a novel. Yeah, yeah I'm I'm yeah. absorbing information all the time, so that's what I'm generally listening for. Of course I listen to my own, the Pro Audio well, Suite. Uh, of course. BOBS. <laughs> I wondered <laughs> when that would when that would come in, but yes, of course. I, I listen to the Pro Audio Suite because I don't edit the show. So I'm always curious to hear what ends up in the show. <laughs> um, you know, like I, I just guess and I'm one of the panelists, so we'll see what happens, what comes out the other end. So for me, it's always entertaining. Um, VOBS, my my live show that's been on the air now 12 years. I don't wow. usually watch that whole thing. I'll watch a little bit to kind of quality check it, but I don't watch it because it's we do it live. I, I kind of lived it. I don't need to usually watch it again. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, those are two shows that I'll usually check in on too. Um, All right. Yeah. And what is your favorite dessert? Ooh, I know this uh, is the tough one, right? <laughs> the other ones were easy. <laughs> mm. Well, I could probably eat every single day if it wasn't going to kill me. Um, I could probably eat a pecan pie like every day mm. if I could. Okay. I would, Same. yeah. Oh man, pecan pie, so good. You even said it right. He said pecan. <laughs> is that a pecan or pecan or pecan. what's what's pecan. the one? Or pecan. Gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. All right, yep. AB, I'll let you round us up. Thank you, George, for joining us and for saying <laughs> sure. pecan the correct way as pecan. And thank <laughs> you to everybody in the audience. We love seeing you guys every week um, pop up in the chat. It brings us such pleasure. Uh, before we go, we just wanted to remind you all that VO Booth Besties has transitioned our Thursday nights to daytime. So we'll be live at 1 p.m. Eastern time, 10 a.m. Pacific. As always, you can find our replays on the podcast the next that time frame doesn't work for you. Uh, JT? Well, we're excited to share that next Monday, our guest speaker is Almeida Bainan of HarperCollins Publishing. And she is going to directly address 
audiobooks. Please head over to boothbesties.com to submit your questions for Almeida, and we'll do our best to include them in our interview. And to keep the conversation going, make sure to connect with each of us on LinkedIn and join our VOBB Facebook group. If you want to hear replays of tonight's episode, um, and I know I need to go back and listen because there was a lot in here, uh, or any previous shows, you can listen on our podcast at boothbesties.com or on YouTube podcasts or wherever you find your favorite podcast. Thank you all and good night. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to another episode of VO Booth Besties. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast. Well, pretty much anywhere they're playing podcasts. And follow us on Instagram and Facebook so we can keep the conversation going. VO Booth Besties. Yeah, it's a thing. thing.